Yes. And one of the uh, fascinating kinds of knowledge is uh, the knowledge of deeply experienced practitioners uh, who have been in the field and doing things uh, often for years or uh, even decades. Yeah. And this is sometimes tacit knowledge. Sometimes it's called an art. Uh, sometimes it's called a professional experience. Right. Uh, I think there's a very rich set of issues around this, but I was convinced by my own experience, by a very thorough analysis of malaria as a disease, by the nature of transmission, by the kinds of people that it was hitting, by the bad experience with trying to sell nets, with the analogies to uh, vaccine coverage, and with the some earlier tests that had been done of mass distribution, especially by the American Red Cross, right. that we knew enough to move, and that by not moving, <laughs> we would risk millions of lives lost. The world did move. Uh, it turned out the academic studies that came in afterwards helped to support those conclusions. I'm very happy about that. I think it played a very constructive role. But I think that the base of decision-making from all points of view the underlying logic, science, uh, the risk balance, uh, the ethics, uh, and so forth, all pointed in a particular direction. All of this comes for me uh, back to a basic idea, which is that context is extraordinarily important. Yeah. Evaluation and decisions is not simply a statistical test. Uh, there's a world of knowledge and expertise, often beyond the economist or the policy analyst, often not even tapped by the economist or policy analyst in what I've observed uh, in uh, my, prof my profession's behavior. I learned a long time ago to ask other professions right. and uh, understand that we have a web of knowledge, just like we have a food web, we have a knowledge web. Uh, and we ought to use that effectively to really think hard and clearly about what our options are when it comes to a policy choice. So do, do you think that um, one of the reasons that your work in this field has become, in some ways, it's become more controversial, even as it's become more widely recognized as being effective, <laughs> is because in academia and in policy circles, um, there's just been a, you know, in and more specialized focus on, on data analysis as opposed to contextual and narrative considerations? Is that, is that part of the reason, you know, there, that, that uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you've been subject to some controversy recently and people, you know, uh, um, you know using statistics as, a way, as, as the sole legitimating uh, uh, avenue for thinking about uh, dealing with these issues? Yes, I think uh, it, I consider it a deeper epistemological question mm -hmm. uh, of what is knowledge and how does one come by it. Mm -hmm. when many uh, economists right now do these randomized trials. They think that they're going to do a clean test, ignoring the past. They will do a set of trials, and then they will look at a T-statistic or an F-test, right. and that will tell them the truth. Uh, this is uh, in statistics, uh, a frequentist approach. Yep. Uh, that, uh, you start with a sample, uh, you, uh, measure the, uh, you measure the, uh, uh, the uh, outcomes of a particular experiment, and that's the universe of knowledge. M my uh, approach has been very, very different, and it's become more different over the last 30 years which is that the more that I have seen and worked now in more than 130 countries around the world, that knowledge is extraordinarily important to me. Yeah. Uh, that knowledge of 30 years of experience <laughs> dealing with malariologists or AIDS docs or public health specialists or demographers or hydrologists or climatologists or agronomists, and it builds up over time. So I find it less persuasive to do one more trial yeah. and a lot more persuasive to have what I regard as uh, not one data set, but a world of data uh, that uh, I tried very, very hard over decades to increasingly master as best I can. And also to look in what are sometimes called epistemic communities right. or knowledge communities for their advice. If you look at this question of what to do with malaria, that was a 
randomized clinical trial without consulting the malariologists. As a Bayesian, that's the alternative to the frequentist approach. Yeah. As a Bayesian who has uh, carries a prior distribution uh, about uh, the probabilities of certain kinds of outcomes based on a lifetime of refining uh, my thoughts and knowledge about this and trying to incorporate new evidence, I never come to a problem starting from scratch and looking at one trial. Uh, yes, I come with what might be called preconceptions, but I would say that those are what Bayesian uh, philosophers uh, call, uh, call call prior distributions, but they haven't come out of uh, nowhere. They, right. uh, whim. Uh, they've come out of uh, a lot of experience. This raises some quite deep questions, actually, yeah. uh, about how a field should behave. People may say, well, but Jeff, you know, how do we trust your judgment? That's a that's that's a good that's question. A good question. Uh, it, it it has been right on on uh, m many many issues like the need to freely distribute bed nets uh, many years before an RCT was actually done, uh, and I could at some length uh, recreate the over a number of hours all the reasons why I came to a particular conclusion all of the prior experience, all of the analogies, all of the logic, all of the risk assessment. I can assure you it was not a lightly taken decision. On the contrary, I worked day and night for several years on this issue and not aiming at a published paper, but aiming actually to get malaria. Practice, yeah. This isn't to denigrate the research, but it is to say that my goal was to stop the disease hit. Then, after the disease has come down sharply, some people say, oh, well, you were lucky. No, that wasn't lucky. <laughs> uh, that, that was yeah. uh, based on very considered views. It's based and on judgment. And as you, st I think, really, you started off is that these judgments are not made in vacuums. They're made in history, and they're made with a long context. I mean, your long context of work in the field, but also of the historical, sociological, economic context of the places in which you're working and in their local knowledges and local epistemologies. And uh, I think the issues you raise for our students are really important. I mean, that they are, the way you put it, multiple ways of knowing and multiple paths to the truth. It's not just about one statistical path. One of the things that's been consistent in your work over a long period of time is a recognition of a moral claim. Um, and, um, I, I, and, and I wonder if you would sp spend a minute uh, talking to our students about the, the, the moral claim. You think that, um, that these uh, global health challenges and, and extreme poverty have on, on people who are, are not suffering from those things when, when, let's say, they're taking a class like this. First, I believe that the field that I'm I'm in, uh, and I love, by the way, I've been doing this for 41 years now, uh, in economics, since I began as a student uh, in 1972, is only useful as a practical field. Right. If it were for the beauty, uh, I would uh, rather watch art, yes. uh, listen to music, uh, watch a good movie, read a novel. Uh, if it were for high intellectual uh, achievement uh, per se, I would uh, rather uh, master mathematics uh, and uh, its uh, dazzling uh, intricacies uh, and uh, all that it accomplishes. I find my field only useful if it can actually do things. Right. Now, also, though, I don't feel that we live in this world as hired guns mm -hmm. to do something that someone says, well, use your tools to do this. I believe that we need to live in a moral framework. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in, in this regard, I find myself mainly an Aristotelian uh, in the sense that uh, Aristotle essentially defined ethics as the kind of behavior consistent with living in the city-state, in the polis. Mm -hmm. uh, and we live in a world where we have to behave in certain ways so that we don't blow each other apart. Right. Uh, so that we act decently, and so on. In this regard, I have found uh, very uh, many moral teachings to be extraordinarily important for guiding me, usually from a pretty eclectic point of view, I have to say. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a fan of the Buddhist uh, idea that all that uh, glitters uh, is, is not uh, what you want to throw your life uh, after. 
Uh, I am a, a big fan of uh, Aristotle's notion that we are social animals and have to behave ourselves uh, in, in living in society. Uh, I am uh, a huge fan of Jesus' teaching uh, that uh, he who feeds uh, the least among me feeds me. Uh, this is a, a basic idea of uh, the Roman Catholic uh, teachings uh, called the preferential option for the poor, mm -hmm. which I deeply believe in. But I also know that Jeremy Bentham uh, in the 19th century had a, a very different take and came to the same conclusion. He, there's a declining marginal utility of income. So transferring money from a very rich person to a very poor person raises the sum of utilities. I can go with that also. I think all of these are important. We cannot live and should not live without a moral framework. We cheat ourselves in our society these days by not having a place where morals are discussed. And morals, as Pope Francis is reminding us every day, morals are not simply strictures or one's views about abortion or yeah. uh, about the do nots and thou shall nots. Uh, morals are about how we treat each other decently. Uh, and uh, what Pope Francis just said in uh, his uh, Evangelii Gaudium, his uh, papal exhortation, uh, that the highest value is mercy. Uh, and uh, that is being decent to others. I believe that. And I also believe uh, that the idea, which is another uh, teaching of, of the church, I'm not a member of, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, but I believe the social teachings are extremely important, are uh, that... Uh, that there is what uh, the, uh, the, the Roman Catholics call the universal destination of goods. And what they mean by that is that you can have private property, but if you come to a situation where private property leads the rich person to say, I don't have to help the starving poor person, that private property claim is overwhelmed by a moral claim. It's called the universal destination of goods. Universal destination of goods. And, and what it means uh, is that uh, already uh, uh, Pope Leo in the 19th century said private property is fine, but it can't override basic uh, human need. Private property is not inviolable. It's human dignity that needs to be treated as the higher good. And so if a rich person says, uh, this is my food, I don't have to share it with that starving person. It's my right. This is a libertarian point of view, for example. Right. Liberty is the number one value. I believe that uh, this is a wrong consideration, that property rights are bound in a moral framework, whether it's Aristotelian or Catholic, or I should say Methodist, because this is also uh, John Wesley and the Methodists played an, an incredible role in history in fighting slavery first, yeah. uh, in saying that this is a kind of property rights that is inconsistent with the human good. And it was the Methodists that played the dominant role in infusing morality into what was one of the great moral victories of modern history, the end of slavery. So I believe this is something for all of us. I am a big fan of uh, the, the field of ethics. Uh, I could read it endlessly. I can see uh, I that. find myself pretty eclectic, but I also uh, find that uh, the, the great sages, whether uh, it's Buddha or whether it's uh, Jesus or, or whether it's uh, the uh, Jewish injunction uh, called Sedek Sedek Tirdof, which in Hebrew means justice, justice shall you pursue. All of these, uh, to my mind, speak the same basic point, which is that we are human beings in a society of others, and it is our moral responsibility to take cognizance and respect uh, of humanity. And Kant, of course, uh, introduced his categorical imperative, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Bentham introduced his utilitarianism, and Rawls introduced uh, uh, his uh, Maximin principle. Students should learn, enjoy, think hard, reflect, apply. But one thing I would say about ethics is if you apply a doctrine and it turns out to lead to bizarre conclusions, maybe your doctrine is too simple. Yeah. This is, in my view, the problem with libertarianism, yeah. uh, which is that, yes, you can take a strong doctrine 
and then end up with a view that says uh, that uh, the rich can leave the, the poor to die. And that is taken by some as a philosophical epiphany. I just regard it as a measure of the uh, paucity of the fundamental bases of the libertarian philosophy. See, you're, you're a pluralist in your approaches to, um, to all of these things, and, and you uh, make sure that you uh, don't follow a, uh, a series of, of steps that lead you into a dogmatic response to anything because dogma is, uh, is never going to be as complex as the situation you're trying to solve. And so it sounds like in all of these things, you, re you use many resources to try to combat a very real problem. And I, I, I have found, if I may say, and maybe it's the nature of how I have viewed this, I've been asked uh, in many times, and sometimes I put myself forward to say, here is a problem that needs to be solved. Now, when you do that, you're working with people in different cultures, different races, different religions, different world outlook. Uh, if you are too dogmatic, you can say goodbye to the yeah. chance to actually solve that problem. Uh, and therefore, it probably comes from my starting point, which is that I have found the most thrilling thing in my professional life to be out in this complex, exciting, sometimes profoundly frustrating, even scary world, trying to ameliorate uh, uh, grave conditions or trying to solve problems where technology or better organization give us a solution, you have to be pretty pragmatic in that uh, because otherwise you'll hit a wall very quickly. Yeah. You ask to go home uh, and you won't have made much progress. And for me, the bottom line uh, is, is actually, I have to say in a strange kind of way, it's not a good try, although that counts. It's actually making progress. So, uh, so as, as our students are thinking about some of these big issues, uh, uh, climate change, extreme poverty, uh, global health challenges, and they want to try to do something, um, not that's going to solve the problems in one fell swoop, obviously, but to do something positive. And uh, before we say goodbye, any, any suggestions about there'll be tens of thousands of students in this class, most of them living outside the U.S., um, are there some things that you would suggest as they finish the class that they, that they do to continue uh, trying to change the world for the better? Absolutely. The first thing is uh, if you've come into this field, whether it's economics or politics or management uh, or some related field, global health, uh, because you're interested in solving problems, never lose that basic motivation. Even if a professor tells you the most important thing is a specific technique and so forth, I'm not against uh, learning the techniques, but the motivation, in my view, is the fundamental source of being, having the perseverance and the ability to get up off the ground, mm -hmm. to keep going, uh, to uh, listen carefully to others, take your bruises, because there's nothing in the world that's organized to make your problem simple. Yeah. So this is the first thing I would say to, to the students. Second... I am a great fan of a concept, which I hope we hear more and more of in future years, sustainable development. That means a holistic view of society, whether it's our city, our community, mm -hmm. our country or the world that takes into account economic, social and environmental considerations holistically. What good is it solving an economic problem if it destroys the environment? Uh, what good is it if the economic problem helps uh, people at the top, but uh, creates even more damage for people at the bottom. So I want holism in, in the approach as a kind of moral uh, mm -hmm. starting yes. point also. And that also puts uh, in mind a third the precept that I've learned is in some ways the hard way, which is keep learning. Uh, you're in a course right now, uh, you're studying, but the issue of sustainable development in a good society is requires lifelong learning. I was already a tenured professor at Harvard University in 1985 when I began to do something practical in Bolivia, and my mouth jaw just fell <laughs> open. Oh my God, nobody taught me about this, about the politics, the, uh, the, the, the many complexities, certainly the management and so forth. <laughs> and I've had to learn 
now uh, over the next 28 years uh, about uh, many of those things. So this is a lifelong learning. There will be huge opportunities for one very real reason. We have huge problems. Human-induced climate change, extreme poverty, uh, big environmental crises, uh, pollution, a uh, big social crises of inequality in our societies, indigenous populations deeply uh, deprived of, uh, of even their basic rights and access to public services. So with eyes open, heart filled, mind filled with lots of good ideas and lots of tools, there's no shortage of great things to do over the next 30 years. The world is very likely to have Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, mm -hmm. as guideposts after 2015. And this will also be another tool for all of us to say, here's a direction we can move. Let's take it on, take on the challenge, get the job done. Jeffrey Sachs, thank you so much for talking with me and for with all our students. It's been inspiring. And thank you for all the great work you're doing. And uh, lots of luck. And uh, look forward to, to more conversations. Wonderful. I, I do as well. And thank you so much for teaching this great course. It's, it's going to be a huge, it is a huge contribution. Thank you. So I've talked to you about becoming aware, provoking care, bringing resources together, marshalling resources. And, um, uh, and, and, and then we have some real design challenges. And we'll, uh, uh, you, that is, we, we, we need to create uh, design patterns of intervention that we test so as to find the ones that work best. Here, technology can play a very important role. And those of you who are perusing all the talks at the Social Good Summit that are linked, many of which are linked to this class, you'll see that there's a great faith in, in technology from mobile devices um, to uh, new modes of uh, vaccine delivery uh, to uh, soccer balls that work as batteries. Uh, technology can, can, play, can play a really important ro role in this regard. Uh, technology is crucial for uh, adding to our resources of uh, clean water, better education, and easier delivery, easier delivery of preventative care. I, I want to emphasize this. I hope I'm not being too repetitive, but these things are already in our grasp. That's one of the things I found striking in preparing this class. As, as you know, I'm no expert in global health. You know, I'm, uh, my own field, is, uh, just to remind you, is I'm a, a 19th and 20th century historian of ideas of philosophy and literature. Um, and as I've been reading for this course and talking to experts uh, from the World Bank to uh, our departments here at Wesleyan about these issues, the thing that I find so uh, remarkable sometimes I find it depressing, sometimes I find it exciting, is that we already know how to make these changes. These things are already in our grasp. Uh, yeah, that can be depressing because, gosh, we know how to do it and we're not doing it, how sad. But what's, we don't want to be sad about this. We actually want to be energized because we know how to make the change. We need the political will and social consensus to make the change happen. Amartya Sen, whose work really inspired a lot of the people in this class, uh, uh, talks about this in, in the following way. He, he says, with adequate social opportunities, individuals can effectively shape their own destiny and help each other. Individuals don't have to be seen as passive recipients of the benefits or of the cunning development uh, programs or we might add of, uh, you know, foreign aid. There is indeed a strong rationale for recognizing, Amartya said, says, for recognizing the positive role of free and sustainable agency among people uh, who are uh, 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 the most vulnerable. Sustainable agency. The kinds of things we're talking about this week in our uh, uh, unit on health and disease is Reducing vulnerability to disease as a mode of enhancing agency of expanding capabilities. We know how to do it. Our job is to put together the social will to bring our knowledge, our care, and our resources to bear on some of the world's most dramatic problems, but problems that together we can begin to address. Thank you.